Uh, for all of those that you are joining, please introduce yourselves in the chat. There are, we expect over 100 people here today. So uh, take the time to tell us who you are in the chat. And uh, we look forward to also hearing from you in our discussion today. My name is Georgia Farouk, and I'm the Executive Director of Thrive, the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County. And on behalf of Thrive Alliance and Sequoia Healthcare District, I wanted to welcome you all to our joint community forum on vaccine equity and on the needs of our local community during this pandemic. So Thrive, for those of you that don't know us, is a cross-sector organization. We have over 200 members that come from the nonprofit sector, government, private sector, um, individual community activists, uh, you name it. Uh, we all work together to strengthen the sector in service of our local community, which is really what brings us here today. Also as background, Thrive has been very active in the County of San Mateo's recovery initiative uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and specifically, we are serving as a hub for 34 nonprofits that are doing COVID-19 outreach to vulnerable communities to help with safety, to help with messaging around um, vaccines, et cetera. And we also have been leading an effort around the st uh, Strategic Alliances for Nonprofits, which is really meant to support nonprofits and help with nonprofit sustainability. Uh, as we've seen in the news recently, now I think nationally, one in three nonprofits could face closure. There are some really stunning numbers, even though San Mateo County has been faring better. <coughs> Bringing it back to today's forum, uh, today we'll have a chance to learn how to more effectively communicate critical vaccine information to our communities through existing community developed toolkits and we'll have a chance to provide feedback on a Stanford study on the impact of the pandemic on local families. <coughs> Excuse me. The title of this forum leads with the words working towards equitable vaccine access and why did we name it that because while we know vaccine equity is a difficult thing to achieve, we're working towards that. And we know that our community is really working tirelessly to get there. Just today, I was really inspired to read an update from our one of our community partners, um, Puente, who uh, provided an update on what they're doing on the coast side to help with vaccinating the farm worker community. And it is just a uh, silver lining and such, such inspiration to read. And I think you'll find that there are many such stories out there about how the community is coming together. And you'll hear a little bit about that today. So the forum today is an opportunity for you to see what the, the county, the state have been doing um, to basically coordinate our efforts. And it's also an opportunity for you to help us identify gaps and ways we can even uh, work together even better. I wanna thank a few uh, key players I want to thank the County of San Mateo for meeting weekly for two Hello. hours. Hello, how are you? Uh, <laughs> oh, good, you're driving home. Uh, just a good time to remind everyone to mute. We were going to do that in the housekeeping, but uh, just wanted to let you know that there are some background noises and we may be hearing your conversation right now. So just mute. Um, so I wanted to thank the County of San Mateo. I will let you know that they have been meeting weekly, two hours every week with community-based organizations to co-develop and support vaccine communication outreach efforts. Uh, it's been a great community-wide effort. We're grateful to be a part of it. I also wanna thank the California Department of Public Health for their willingness to join us today to share tools and answer our questions. And I wanted to thank Stanford University's John Gardner Center for Youth and their communities for sharing progress on their survey and inviting input today and to all the community organizations led by Redwood City um, together that contributed, we're really grateful. And finally, I wanna thank Sequoia Healthcare District for having the vision for this forum. It was CEO Pamela Kurtzman who came to me with this idea and she really wanted to find a way to disseminate this important state and county vaccine communication toolkit information even more broadly. We know it's getting to pockets of the community uh, but uh, many don't know about it. And she also wanted to share important findings on the impact of the pandemic. So with that, I will pass it along to Pamela who will tell you a little bit about the healthcare district and walk us through today's agenda. Thank you so much, Pamela. 
All right, thank you, Georgia. So again, my name is Pamela Kurtzman. Uh, I'm CEO at Sequoia Healthcare District, and I wanna thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's really great to see so many familiar faces. A lot of our community-based organizations are here and our community leaders, and it's great that you took the time away from your schedules to, uh, to join us. Um, for those, though, who don't know about the district, I'm just going to give a super high-level overview and a brief overview of, of who the district is uh, and just a, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm going to let, first of all, we're a local government agency. We were formed in 1946. And we were formed to build and own and operate Sequoia Hospital. And that's what we did for over 50 years. And uh, we sold the hospital in 2007. Uh, and although we no longer own the hospital, we have a, a really great collaboration and partnership with the new owners, which is, uh, was Catholic Healthcare West when we sold it, which is now Dignity Health. Um, we are one of 78 healthcare districts across the state. Um, several of them still own hospitals, and as I said, we no longer own our hospital. Um, we have a five-member publicly elected board of directors separate from the hospital. Um, these are elected by the residents in our community, and the community that we serve is very defined. We are the southern half of San Mateo County, and those um, cities include, it's weird how their lines were drawn. Think about how our geography was um, 46, in 1946, there were areas where people were, weren't living. So um, we have a third of Foster City, because that was hardly developed back then. We have um, Belmont, Redwood City, that includes Redwood Shores. We have all of San Carlos and Redwood, uh, Redwood City, including um, North Fair Oaks area, um, Atherton, Portola Valley, um, Belmont, Woodside, and Menlo Park. And so we have a very diverse community from some of the uh, most wealthy zip codes in the nation to some of the most challenged economic uh, areas. Uh, we are primarily funded through property tax dollars and our budget's about 15 million a year. And we have a goal to take 100% of those dollars and put it back into the community for public um, health services. And we do that through a number of ways. We serve about 80 different nonprofits that we partner with. Um, and they serve district residents uh, through various means of um, from anything from um, zero to five through aging programs um, and make a huge impact in our community. We also fund some clinics, uh, medical clinics like Ravenswood and Samaritan House and significant amounts of dollars for those agencies. Grateful for the work that they do. And we have our own signature programs. We have our Healthy Schools Initiative is our largest program. It's a four and a half million dollar partnership per year with our local schools, um, supporting 28,000 students and teachers and staff and families uh, and about eight schools and there are eight school districts within our region. So if you wanna know more details about the district, just look on our website, we're at seqhd.org. Um, and or you can call it or email me and I'm happy to answer any specific questions that you might have. So before we jump into today's agenda, I just have a couple of housekeeping items that I want to go over for today's event. Uh, we have a large group of attendees and we have a large group of presenters. So first, I want to make sure that you mute yourselves and I think uh, the uh, Thrive staff will also be muting people, but in case something happens like came up earlier, just, just check your mute button uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, we're also um, gonna make use of the chat box today. That's where you're gonna enter questions for the presenters and just ask questions as they come to you. Uh, we're gonna monitor the chat box and we'll be answering questions during the Q&A. And then this meeting is being recorded. And we're going to be offering it later on both the Thrive and the district websites. And so I think that's it for the, uh, for the housekeeping. Uh, I think you know why we're here today and why we invited you here today, but I'm just going to reiterate a couple of things that Georgia had mentioned. Um, Thrive and Sequoia Healthcare District have joined forces with our county partners to bring you information um, today because together we have a strong alliance with almost every CBO in the county. And you, our community leaders and our CBOs, have earned the trust of those that you serve who are best positioned to help get our community all vaccinated. And so, but to achieve this, we need to encourage and to motivate our residents to get vaccinated. 
We need to give them the accurate information they need in a language they understand and through messages that are culturally relevant and sensitive to their concerns. And you know the importance of this as does the county. So the county through the Vaccine and Communications Equity Working Group developed a communications toolkit that you're gonna learn about this afternoon. You're also hear about a study from the John Gardner Center that assessed rates of housing, food, healthcare, childcare, and job insecurity in the greater North Fair Oaks community um, before and after the pandemic began, as well as challenges of distance learning and knowledge of community-based resources such as rental assistance and food distribution. The study offers a powerful foundation from which to assess and address the unmet needs. By leveraging their research expertise, along with direct service providers, you guys, uh, we can divert resources to where they are needed most. So today, our hope is that you will be able to use the data that you will gain, uh, and you'll be able to use a wide range or gain a wide range of knowledge on the state and local vaccine efforts, and be able to use the toolkit that's provided um, with uh, clear, concise, and accurate information. And that is, as you, our community leaders and trusted service providers, you're best positioned again to use these materials within your community. So with that, I'm going to just take a minute and review the agenda for today uh, before I hand it over to Georgia, who is going to MC our discussion and I'm gonna do the Q&A. So as soon as I'm done talking here, we're going to, uh, George is going to introduce uh, our speaker, Carolyn Becker from the state, um, who will provide some um, information on their efforts. Uh, that's gonna be followed by a 10 minute Q&A. And then we're gonna hear from our county uh, partners uh, and that's for about 30 minute presentation. We have several uh, presenters from the county. That's gonna be followed again by 10 minute Q&A. And I wanna remind you to put questions in the chat box as we go along. Um, we are going to be checking that frequently. Um, finally, we're gonna hear from Brandon um, Balzer Carr from Stanford, who will um, present on that study I've been talking about. And we will then again have another 10 minutes for Q&A with him. And then it's going to be wrapped up uh, by Georgia uh, in the last 10 minutes. And, um, and so I look forward to a really exciting uh, and informative discussion today. And uh, without further ado, because we've got a lot to cover, I'm going to kick it off to Georgia uh, so she can uh, get things started. So thanks. Thank you, Pamela, and uh, so excited about our speakers today. And I will introduce our speaker from the California Department of Public Health, who is Carolyn Becker, who is a senior communications officer there. Uh, Carolyn is coordinating the state's media and communications initiative around the COVID-19 vaccine in conjunction with the Office of Governor Gavin Newsom and the California Health and Human Services Agency with respect to the broader COVID-19 harm reduction campaign. Prior to serving the state of California, Carolyn was a senior vice president at Mercury Public Affairs, where she ran large-scale communications efforts related to health and social justice, including as a campaign lead and account project manager for the state of California's Census 2020 communications campaign. Before that, Carolyn was an executive producer for the top-rated news station in Sacramento. Carolyn, thank you so much for visiting San Mateo County today, and we are uh, really thrilled to have you. Thanks, Georgia. Thank you so much. Just doing a quick check that everybody can hear me okay. Yes, great. Thank you for nodding. I appreciate that in this virtual world. I do wish I could visit San Mateo County right now, but I think that underscores why the vaccine campaign is so critical, not just for me personally, but we all, literally every human has skin in this game. And so that makes it a really meaningful campaign, perhaps the most meaningful campaign I've ever had the pleasure of working on. Um, I do think we have some slides that I'll walk you through today. So I'm not sure who's driving that. Georgia, is that you? Oh no, here we go. Great. Terrific. So yes, again, Carolyn Becker, uh, I am inside the California Department of Public Health, but really this campaign comprehends uh, many, many, many state departments and agencies all under the coordination of the Office of the Governor. So happy to walk you through some of the high level um, pieces of that today and how we arrived where we are. Today, go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll show you a little bit about what we're talking about today in our agenda. Thank you. Um, I will walk you through some of the formative research we did at the onset of this campaign, uh, really to make sure that everything we were developing in, in terms of messaging and content was informed by the community and informed by data and research um, to help us 
uh, achieve success at, at, and maximize our opportunity to empower Californians to get the vaccine as soon as they're eligible. We will, of course, address um, vaccine hesitancy. That's a very real topic for many Californians. I, I think most of you are probably well aware of that. And then I'll point you towards some resources that we will continue to populate and happy to share. And we're so grateful for groups like yours and others across the state who are just reaching out and saying, how can we help? Uh, as I mentioned, we all have something at stake here. And, and it's um, just incredible to see how many hands going up in the air saying, how can we help? All right, so on to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we did quite a bit of research and I don't mean to suggest that it's over. This campaign will be informed by research and data throughout, but to give you a sense of how we got where we are now, um, we engaged a, a research partner, Social Quest, to help us start with some formative research to really develop um, critical understanding of the barriers, including hesitancy, but also sometimes access and other um, attitudes that might uh, make people skeptical or cautious around this, uh, uh, around these particular vaccines and the COVID vaccine in general. Um, we wanted to, on the flip side, when we understood the barriers, also understood the attitudes and motivators for people to accept the vaccine and actually, um, you know, go visit a clinic and get a shot in the arm. Obviously, supply being a, a big uh, constraint but we want supply to be our only constraint. And that tide is turning. We are expecting to get more supply. So a lot of this uh, research will, come, will become even more critical as time moves on. Um, we're doing quite a bit of research right now to understand the baseline. We have some idea of the baseline when it comes to hesitancy and acceptance, but we have an exciting body of research that will roll out uh, at the end of this month that'll give us a really solid understanding of baseline so that we can measure our campaign in real time and understand how well we are doing at empowering Californians, as I mentioned. And then the research also helps us identify uh, the best communications channels to deliver all of the messages that we're developing. Thing. And I mean that whether it's a traditional platform or a non-traditional platform, um, we'll get into that when we, when we talk a little bit more about the communications approach. Continuing on the theme of research, I'm not going to read this slide to you. Hopefully um, we can offer an opportunity to circulate this as appropriate, but some really key takeaways as a, as a result of a, a initial literature review, meaning we took a, a deep dive into all of the research that's been done to date around this vaccine and, and frankly other vaccines as well. This one being different in that it was developed in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, um, the the title warp speed has both um, negative connotations as well as um, you know kind of a, a a positive frame in that we were able to get a vaccine uh, in California and in into the universe quite frankly at a at a. Uh, um, uh, quick pace, but people making them nervous about how quick that happened and whether safety was compromised. So a lot, a lot of just deep diving into the research to understand uh, where we can um, where we can help Californians get educated, what they need to learn more about in order to feel comfortable with this vaccine. So a lot of these uh, bullet points that you see here uh, are things that we took a deep dive into and really helped us understand what do Californians in particular and vulnerable Californians even more particularly associate with being comfortable with this vaccine. Next slide. Thank you so much. Um, on the messaging side, of course, we wanna highlight the safety and the benefits of the vaccine. As I mentioned, warp speed also um, compromised our ability to convince people that it went through the proper channels, the proper clinical trials and the proper channels of review. So we've done a lot of uh, work in that space to educate people how we were able to get a vaccine developed so quickly. Um, I, I feel like I've become a little bit of an expert and I, and I, and I say that loosely, but in, in mRNA technology, because the truth is that this vaccine uh, technology was in development even before the COVID pandemic. So uh, the work really did start years ago. And I think when people start to understand that, they, they understand it wasn't quite um, that warp speed in the, in the unsafe way they associate it with. But we also took a look at things like um, side effects, right? That's a, con that's a real concern for people who are scared about the vaccine. And tr we're trying to underscore um, how normal side effects are, not only with vaccine 
vaccines generally, but this one, and frankly, how far scarier COVID is, and um, that side effects are actually uh, a sign that your body is doing what it should when it receives a vaccine, but also balancing the expectation that not everybody will experience side effects, and it doesn't matter either way, whether you do or don't mean um, the vaccine is proven to be safe and effective for all adults. So uh, leaning in on some of these issues that people uh, are a little bit nervous about has been an important part of our early education as vaccines roll out in California. And then I think um, many of you know that equally as important as the messaging is the messengers and who is delivering those messages to our various communities, whether it's influencers in sort of the, you know, broad celebrity sense or influencers in the home, right? Your mother, your doctor, your pastor. So we're looking at all different messengers and really working with our community partners to understand the sphere of influence around our key audience, which is the most vulnerable uh, communities in California, those who've been the hardest hit by COVID, and those who live in the lowest quartile of what we call the Healthy Places Index. Um, and I'll get more into sort of those communications channels as well as, as we continue on through this presentation. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this slide outlines a lot of the barriers, and I think you've probably read a lot about some of these um, uh, particular nuances that, that prevent people from wanting to get a vaccine. Um, sometimes it's just a liter literally a lack of education, and I think that does get tied up in hesitancy, and they do go together. But I think there's a difference between a Californian who is hesitant because they don't know what they need to know about the vaccine, and a Californian who is hesitant because they have a general fear of vaccines or a distrust of vaccines and, and the whole program um, more on the traditional sort of anti-vax side of the house. We are, and I'll talk a little bit in this um, presentation today about our audiences and how we're treating them a little bit differently, but really understanding and being empathetic towards vaccine hesitancy and just helping educate people so that we can move that needle. And I don't mean any pun by that, but move the needle in terms of um, helping Californians in particular understand that the vaccines are our single best tool to end this pandemic together. Go on. Thank you so much. And so here are some, um, here are the three main audience segments that we're really focused on as a result of all of that research. Uh, I mentioned hesitancy and that takes on different um, sort of frames, right? We have our cautious Californians who might be open to take taking the vaccine, but they're a little skeptical. They don't necessarily want to be first. And we actually have an ad coming out uh, in a couple of weeks who, and part of the track, the script for that ad says, if you don't want to be first, that's okay, you're not. There are lots of Californians uh, getting the vaccine right now. It obviously went through trials, but maybe there's some, some cautiousness around the vaccine. And as supply ramps up, we just want to ensure that when there is ample supply and it is available to all of us, we've helped the cautious Californians really overcome that hesitancy. We also have the confused those who are um, reluctant or actively refusing the vaccine and, and you know, willing to dominate the conversation regardless of accuracy. And, and we call them the confused in public health because we know that that's a lack of education around the science behind the vaccine, but it's a very real audience for us um, to, to speak to. And kind of delineating between the three, the cautious, the confused, and the convinced is an important um, uh, part of how we segment our messages and how and how we deliver them. And the last one I just mentioned being the convinced. Uh, we have plenty of Californians, in fact, more Californians than supply right now who, who want to take the vaccine, who are eager to get it. You've probably read in the news about vaccine chasers. Um, and so we understand that we need to help people navigate the vaccines. And there's um, been some confusion around the complexity of California's eligibility system. So it's part of our job on the communications campaign uh, to not just persuade those who are hesitant, but to actually help people who want the vaccine as soon as possible find it. Next slide. Great. So um, as I mentioned, empowering our communities to get the vaccine is really is really at the root of everything we're communicating, whether it's having the right messenger, disseminating information in language and in culture. I mentioned that lowest uh, quartile, it's about um, 8.1 million Californians, 400 
140 or so zip codes across our state. Um, we want to make sure that those 8.1 Californians know we're talking to them. So culturally uh, congruent messaging and content is really a, a key for this campaign. When I uh, point you to that third bucket about humanizing lived experiences, that's where the empathy comes in. You know, it is okay to have questions. It's okay to be skeptical. Uh, it's okay to not want to be first. We, we want to demonstrate that we understand sort of the journey you as a human have to, to uh, travel in order to get from potentially skeptic to accepting of this vaccine. And then the more people uh, who see others who look like them getting the vaccine, perhaps the more comfortable uh, our communities uh, will feel about it. So that's what we mean when we talk about humanizing lived experiences is just acknowledging uh, the experience that we all have with this vaccine and frankly with this pandemic because it's been very personal, I think, for, for everybody. And then lastly, using channels to reach people where they are um, is really about, um, it's really about meeting people in their community through communications, whether that's they get up every morning and read the newspaper or whether they're sitting at a coffee shop and there's a message on the sidewalk. It's really about uh, finding people where they already are so that we don't expect them to come to us. It's the other way around. So some of the key messages that we've really drilled down on in the early part of this campaign, and I suspect we will not uh, derive too far from these because they are really the foundational messages, is uh, about the safety and ef efficacy of the, of the vaccines. And it's now all three, right? We have Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and Pfizer, uh, the newest one being Johnson & Johnson, and a lot of questions about that, a lot of questions about uh, you know, why it might be positioned as less effective. The, the bottom line is all three of these are safe and all three of these are highly effective at preventing severe COVID hospitalization and death, which is why we are in this pandemic in the first place. We're not in a pandemic because people get colds every year or people get a flu every year. It's because of the toll this has taken on, on lives uh, and in hospitals and all three vaccines put a stop to that. And, and that is why we say vaccines are the most most powerful tool to end this pandemic. It's because of why we got here in the first place. And when we talk a little bit about motivators, we and we've tested different messages, particularly in different ethnic groups, but helping us return to a normal life is a common uh, motivator that I think we can all appreciate. Uh, also vaccines being free, that helps with our access issues. You don't need insurance, you don't need um, a particular immigration status. So we're, we're tailoring some of those messages about uh, access to the different communities. And of course your personal information being confidential and protected when you get a vaccine. I have an asterisk on that point because we're actually starting to see uh, in our focus groups, some people really drawn to that message so that they understand, you know, say if you're an undocumented Californian, you understand that filling out some base, basic paperwork at the vaccine site is, is, is going to be protected. On the flip side, we're seeing some communities who are like, well, why are you telling us it's going to be confidential and protected? We already assume that. This is a medical process to get a vaccine. We always assume that's confidential and protected. And by leaning in too high on that message, you're kind of making us skeptical. So we're, we're continuing to probe into that and test that with the different groups uh, we're talking to. Okay, so now broadly, just taking a step back um, and talking about our overall public education and outreach campaign. Um, I know uh, I was introduced as, a, as the person at, in the nucleus of our communications, and that's true, but our communications is taking on uh, a very much a coordinated air game and ground game that I'll share with you momentarily. But our, our general overarching strategy is to educate, motivate, and activate Californians to get vaccinated when it's their turn. And that is not a sequential phasing. We are educating, motivating, and activating different kinds of Californians at different moments, um, particularly around this uh, environment in which supply is so limited and eligibility is also um, you know, structured in such a way that California is able to distribute vaccines equitably and helping people understand not just when it's their turn, but why we're doing it this way. Uh, it's really, um, it's really a critical component of this campaign. So when I say educate, motivate, and activate, it may be any one of those dials at any given moment, depending on the audience and the, and the um, moment in time in which we find ourselves throughout the coming months for the duration of this campaign. We're also 
addressing, as I mentioned, barriers like a lack of access and hesitancy, helping Californians navigate that eligibility process, and combating and uh, combating and addressing myths and disinformation will be a, a key is already and will continue to be a very very critical part of this campaign. It goes hand in hand with education. And just to put a finer point on what that what what I'm talking about, misinformation is, is essentially a rumor. Um, you know, you heard something from a friend, you saw it on social media, you retweeted it. Turns out it wasn't true. You didn't know you were spreading false information. But this is a rumor that in this day and age of information and social media just spreads like wildfire. Disinformation, on the other hand, uh, is generated by uh, a bad actor who is intentionally trying to undermine the educational efforts that we're doing. And the, and the way to combat either of those, uh, there are different tactics we can take, including engaging with tech partners here in California, like Twitter or Facebook. Um, but really, both of them are best combated through education and facts and science and data that help Californians understand what's real and what isn't. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Oops, back up one. I mentioned that we have an air game and ground game. And what we mean by that is your air game is your traditional sort of marketing and advertising communications campaign. Uh, I mentioned um, the uh, intentionality up for us to be culturally congruent, focusing on in language and multicultural content for people to see themselves in our ads and really working with ethnic media partners. And I do say partners. Um, we're not just buying spots and dots. We're actually actively bringing trusted media companies to the table to help um, uh, to give us their insights, what they're hearing from their audiences, ethnic media, in my experience, and I think a lot of your experience as well, is far um, superior to mainstream media when it comes to advocating for their audiences and really trying to help uh, vulnerable Californians in particular have access to resources so that they are such a key part of our work here. Um, when I say traditional and non-traditional platforms, that's kind of like what I mentioned earlier. You've got your uh, digital, radio, TV, billboards, sort of the, the sort of normal advertising tactics. But we're also looking at engagements with entities like barbershops and ha how do we maybe brand, um, you know, the aprons they wear or or a, a supermercado mercado on the on the corner in a Latino community. You know, how how can we engage and really find people where they already are, as I mentioned. Um, uh, some of these other points I've touched on already, but the, the whole air game addresses all of these issues about lack of access and hitting home on those hesitancy pieces, which, as I mentioned, is really a component of just continued ongoing and, and frankly, repetitive education. But we will we will uh, tell this story until we're blue in the face so that people understand how critical this is. And the next slide is the is the ground game, um, and really these are this is a two way street. The air game and the ground game have to work hand in hand together so that we can hear the insights on the ground and address them in the air, and vice versa. Getting the analytics from our advertising and and working with our our literally our boots on the ground to help disseminate information in community. So we are leveraging trusted messengers at the community level. Uh, the state has actually funded. Uh, upwards of 150 community-based organizations just in the last month or so. They are all onboarding uh, right now as we speak and developing materials like door hangers or car wallet cards, actual materials that they can safely disseminate in communities so that people understand uh, that the vaccine is accessible and safe. Um, the state's also got a, a pretty incredible and robust relationship with philanthropy. So there's an ability to maximize the campaign, leveraging that relationship with CBOs who are funded uh, with philanthropic dollars. And then, of course, uh, at CDPH, we work hand in hand with our county and local partners, the local health uh, jurisdictions or local health departments. Uh, many of you represent, I believe, and, and you all have CBO networks as well. So really trying to ensure that we're uh, singing from the same song sheet, disseminating the same messaging, uh, and helping Californians navigate this process uh, in real time as, as the vaccine rolls out. We're also working across the state. I mentioned that at the top. We have 
Um, I could, I probably could not even count on the on both hands the number of departments and agencies who are helping us get the word out. Uh, state government, as you well know, touches Californians every day. So how can we leverage those platforms that we already have access to, whether it's at the DMV or the California State Lottery, right, with vaccine messaging and helping bring all Californians along. Thank you. And then yes, last but not least, something um, we're really excited to share with you all and to continue to build on is a couple of resources. I think I've got a, a link there for you on the next page. Um, if you go to vaccinateall58.com, that might be an easier way to remember how to get to this toolkit. Um, and I'm, I say toolkit, but it's really a resource library that we're building out all of the time. It does currently have materials in over yeah, 18 languages, including fact sheets and social media graphics. Um, there, we have an FAQ, and these are just some examples. Thank you for flipping through them. Um, uh, and, and, and as I mentioned, we, we are building out materials on a regular basis, and we invite folks to share and to amplify. So really critical uh, resource for you all to check out. Carolyn, think, thank yeah. you. I don't want to cut you short. I know um, that we have, I want to allow at least five minutes for some sure. questions. That was so informative, really well presented, um, and obviously really well researched and thoughtful. Um, there were a couple of things I just want to I want to just kind of revisit on some of the myths. Uh, and, and and again, we have just a few minutes, so I'm no gonna problem. Quick quick answers, but that was exceptional. Really, thanks a lot. Um, going to uh, a couple of the areas uh, looking at some of the myths that that we have been hearing. Um, one of them you touched on uh, with the J&J &J vaccine, but we didn't really, I want to talk just a little bit more about that. Some of the Catholic bishops are discouraging the use of the J&J &J vaccine, calling it morally corrupt. Yep. The stem cells. So even though in December, the Vatican released guidance that the COVID vaccines are morally acceptable, how are you addressing that type of hesitancy and that type of that's a great question and, and extremely timely with the arrival of J&J &J, and it will continue to grow with the arrival of AstraZeneca, um, you know, in the future. Right now, all of the experts agree and I believe the uh, U.S. Uh, con uh, Catholic Conference put out a statement to this effect as well, that the best vaccine is the one you have access to right now. It's it's when you're eligible, get the one you can. Um, and so we're, we're encouraging Californians to think about it that way. Any of these vaccines are better than having COVID and under, but, but being empathetic though to the to the moral argument. And if there, I know that the Catholic Church has said, if you do have a choice, which right now is few and far between, but if you do have a choice, you know, favor Moderna or Pfizer for the reasons that you're personally comfortable with. Right now, most Californians do not have a choice. And we're saying um, the best way to end this pandemic is to get the vaccine you have access to. But it's a great question and it's messaging that we'll continue to fine tune. Okay, thank you. I think that's really helpful for all of those of us trying to um, to um, communicate the right words. Uh, there's another question around, I don't know if it's a misinformation or the disinformation that you described, um, but it's, a, it's around the rumor that um, the government's using the vaccine to insert microchips into individuals. Have you seen a change in people's attitudes um, to the vaccines after receiving specific messaging? And then what kind of messaging has been the most successful in, in combating misinformation? And I just got about two minutes. Yeah, no problem. So I will address your question at a very high level. The best way to counter mis or disinformation is with facts and science and education. And, and I know that's really broad answer, but the more we can talk about not just saying that it's safe and effective, but why we're so confident in that, all of the various reviews that these vaccines have been for uh, through the more Californians I think can feel comfortable. And to your point about have we seen a shift? Yes, from the beginning to now, as Californians are getting this vaccine and we are not seeing, you know, adverse reactions take place across the country in really, you know, big ways. I think people are starting to understand, oh, this is this is actually um, something that is going to help all of us and protect our health and, and frankly, put an end to the pandemic. Wonderful. I think that's very practical and good advice. Um, thank you so much for that really fantastic presentation. Um, we don't have any other questions in the chat and we are out of time. So I'm going to hand the mic back over yeah, to Georgia. One question um, oh. is, are we, are we good with questions? Any others? We're fine. Yeah. Right. There's actually two, if you could address them quickly. Um, 
one from Melissa and one from Emma Gonzalez. Oh, I'm not seeing them in my chat. Uh, I don't have it pulled up either. Yeah, I will relay I them. Can read them. Yeah. So um, these are both from the Office of Community Affairs, and one wants to know which ethnic media partners are you working with in San Mateo County? Well, oh gosh, very specific. Right now, our buys are all coming together. We do have ads hitting the air later this month. As I said, there have already been ads to date um, that were launched in December. So I don't have that answer off the top of my head, but we are actually working to tell that story in a more local way, understanding that we'll have questions like that quite a bit throughout this campaign. So um, stay tuned. I can get back to you guys. I'm sure um, somebody here is willing to, to put us in touch, and I do want to be able to answer those questions for you. I think the uh, the next question is kind of a follow up, which is um, from our Office of Community Affairs, which is if you're allocating any of the media buys by county. Um, by zip code, really. The HPI core tile that I talked about, Healthy Places Index, uh, as I said, we're really targeting 8.1 million Californians or so across upwards of 400 zip codes. It does cover all of the media markets in California, as you can imagine, but some areas more concentrated than others. So that's how surgical we're getting, particularly with digital, um, to, to reach the, the, the most disproportionately impacted by COVID uh, communities in our state. And again, if there are other questions that come out in the chat or you just didn't get to and you think about it later, but it, what maybe it would have been for Carolyn, we're going to be tracking these questions so we could always Great. get back to you uh, at a later time. Great. And these questions are helpful for us to know what, what people want to know. So I appreciate it and keep them coming. Good. Thank you, Thanks Carolyn. Again. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, My we'll pleasure. Here, and we invite you to stay for the rest of the session. Uh, and uh, participate uh, as you can. I also wanted to mention that we have copies of Carolyn's slides. There were a few at the end that she didn't get to that really dive into the resources and give some visuals um, for the toolkit. So fact sheets and video PSAs and some there are some great tools there. So I think you, um, if you're interested, you should explore that and we will send the, the slides as a follow-up as well. So thank you again, Carolyn. Um, and now I am going to introduce uh, a team actually from the County of San Mateo, uh, a team that represents the County Manager's Office as well as the Office of Community Affairs and County Health. So you can see that um, many elements of the county are working together on this. Um, and they are also um, here with a special guest from the community. Uh, many of us know these individuals. I'm not gonna go into their bios. I'm just gonna uh, let you know who has been working on this presentation, who is here with us today. We have Peggy Jensen, who is Deputy County Manager of San Mate uh, County of San Mateo. We're also joined by Jessica Stanfield Mullen, who is the Sustainability Program Manager for Livable, Livable Communities, Office of San Mateo. Uh, Danielle Lee, the Assistant Director of the Office of Sustainability. Emma Gonzalez, who is the Community Affairs Manager for the County Manager's Office of Community Affairs. Uh, and then we have Shireen Malakafas Zali, who is a senior manager for health policy, planning and equity for Get Healthy San Mateo County. And uh, very excited to say that she's also the incoming chief equity officer. So, and I think today's presentation really does a nice job bridging both those roles. We also have special guest Miriam Yabunkwe from who is executive director of Nuestra Casa. <clears throat> With that, I'd like to uh, pass it over to Jessica Stanfield Mullen, who will be kicking off the presentation and just wanna make sure we've got um, the slides ready to go. Yeah, Megan, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Georgia. Um, so for today, we are um, going to present on our vaccine equity and communications toolkit that we have been developing through the county um, along with um, about 200 of our county partners over the, the past several months. So we can go to our next slide, please. Uh, for our agenda today, we wanted to start off with an activity to sort of talk about um, kind of uh, where you or your community partners are at in terms of feeling about the vaccine, where you're getting your information from. Next, we'll go, um, we'll have a presentation on our, um, on San Mateo County's um, COVID-19 vaccination process. Then we'll talk about our vaccine communications and equity working group, followed up by um, looking at the targeted outreach that we have done on the COVID-19 and um, specifically on the vaccine, uh, part of the toolkit, the community plans that we have developed. 
And then we will um, have Miriam sort of talk about some of the community partners' successes with um, either strategies or messaging that has been working within their community to help answer some of the questions around the vaccine, as well as motivate folks to sign up and get vaccinated. We can go to our next slide. So for today, we wanted to, um, to do a poll within Mentimeter. Um, so if you go to, um, to the website Menti, um, it's www.menti.com. When you go there, it'll ask you to enter a code. If you could enter 37589024 when prompted, it'll take you to our next slide, um, which um, we will um, have a question for you. Everybody a moment to enter the code. And um, what we're asking is if you could enter three words to describe how your community is feeling about the vaccine at this time. Some of our first responses already, excited and impatient. These are some great responses that are coming in. Looks like excited, maybe frustrated, impatient are some of our, our key words that are, that are being entered by more than by multiple folks. See hopeful, confused, relieved. Give it another moment to see if we have some more, more responses here. Hesitant, cautious, relieved. Suspicious, worried. Left out, happy. Confused on where to go. Give it just a couple more minutes. We oh, we have somebody who's they've entered into the chat. Hopeful, excited, anxious, impatient, cautious, afraid. So if we can go to our next slide, uh, we we did this um, this word cloud with our community partners that are working with us through our vaccine communications and outreach. Um, outreach work group. And we we saw a lot of similar responses. Um, back in um, January uh, of 2021, um, we had about 40% of our responses um, were sort of were, were those around hope, hopefulness, um, readiness, excited, being eager to get to get the vaccine. Um, but we also saw that 60% of the responses centered around people feeling anxious, unsure, uninformed, afraid. Um, so really sort of um, a, a good split between those who were ready and eager to, to receive the vaccine, um, those who were motivated and those who, um, you know, who were, who were confused or very cautious or, uh, or you know, mistrustful of, of the vaccine in the process. And so we have been working with our community partners to, um, to help educate everybody about the process, maybe answer a lot of the questions that they have around the vaccine and the vaccine process. Um, so that those who were unsure, maybe move them to a point where they, they feel comfortable to consider getting the vaccine um, with the hope that we can then move them to a place where when it is their turn to receive a vaccine, um, they, will, they will feel informed and comfortable enough to, to receive it. So we can go to our next slide. We also have a second question for you um, through Mentimeter. We wanted to, um, to know where does your community look for accurate information about the vaccine? We have a, a few options and we're asking you to pick the top three. It could either be the media, newspaper, TV, social media, uh, maybe through public health agencies, whether those are local, state, or federal, uh, through their providers, whether it's, it's um, doctors or clinics, local government, state government, federal government, family and friends, whether there's community groups, nonprofits, or pharmacies. I 
give folks another minute or two to, to rank their preferences. Looks like we have a few standing out around the media, family, friends, peers, the providers, uh, social media, public health groups. This is great. And then, uh, so it looks like friends, family, and, and peers sort of are ranking at the top here in terms of of getting accurate information about the vaccine closely followed by by TV, newspaper, traditional media sources, um, and then um, followed by, by providers, public health agencies, and social media. We can go to our next slide. We have, I have one more additional question for you. How does your community find out about, about vaccine eligibility and opportunities to be vaccinated? Again, this is sort of, um, you can pick up to, to your top three um, all the similar categories that we had before, do they find out maybe via the media, the um, traditional media, social media, um, public health agencies, their doctor or clinics, local government, state government, federal government, family, friends and peers, community groups or nonprofit organizations or pharmacies? So it looks like the, the overwhelming top pick is, is family, friends, and peers um, followed closely by, um, behind providers, doctors, and clinics. Um, and then it looks like maybe a local government, public health agencies, um, and then sort of followed by media and social media. And then also community groups, nonprofits, and organizations. So we can go to our next slide, please. So with that, um, sort of keeping those responses in mind, we wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, the vaccine process. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Serene, and then we'll um, follow up um, with the, um, the outreach, commu uh, vaccine communications and outreach work group, some of the strategies um, and messages that we've been able to develop with our community partners um, on the collateral and, and some success stories that we've had. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shereen. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Shereen malik -Azali. I'm the Health Equity Officer for San Mateo County. And as Georgia mentioned, I will be transitioning to become the Chief Equity Officer, um, which I'm excited about and look forward to working with you in that position. Next slide. I wanted to start by just one acknowledging what was written in that Mentimeter around things being confusing, frustrated, frustrating, complicated, and just try to summarize why this rollout has been so confusing and complicated. One major factor is the limited supply of the vaccines. It really necessitated this complicated prioritization and eligibility process, mainly for the reason of trying to achieve equity. This, um, the compl complicated allocation process too, where you have um, different providers receiving the allocations of the vaccine and then running their own process, whether it's county health as a provider, having a specific process for how you register, when you become eligible. Kaiser has their own process based on their patient population, the vaccine that they have access to, um, Sutter Health, Ravenswood, there's just a lot of different pathways um, and not one portal to walk into. And then we are also, as providers, we are not getting a lot of lead time. We actually don't know how much vaccine we're gonna get until the week before. So it's very difficult to plan long-term ahead, which we normally would like to do with such a massive operation like this. But the good news is ultimately there will be enough vaccine for everyone. So I, while we recognize that everyone's impatient and everyone should absolutely try to get uh, a vaccine where they, where they can, when they're eligible and when it's their turn, 
Um, we also just want to share that there will be enough vaccine and we will be able to get everyone vaccinated. And the piece to think about, which I think I forget of oftentimes is that we've really only had these vaccines available for about 10 weeks now. And these massive operations have been stood up and implemented, but given what we've been able to achieve in, the, in this 10 weeks, I think we can expect a lot for the next 10 weeks. Next slide. At the forefront of our mind from the beginning of this vaccine effort was how do we ensure equitable distribution? Equity has been a key primary focus of the state as well. And we have just taken a, a, a finer tooth comb looking at what does that mean for San Mateo County? And we developed a seven point equity approach. One was around transparency, being transparent with the science, the data, our own vaccination process, prioritizing those that shoulder the most risk, even within populations. We know that healthcare workers are really critical and important, but we also know that there are people who are working as janitors in hospitals and our in-home supportive service workers who are some of the most impacted populations. They also were focused, a focus of our distribution planning. We also wanted to acknowledge explicitly the negative and painful history of healthcare in the US in government and research, um, particularly in communities of color, as well as the current health inequities that have led to the distrust and a lot of the hesitancy that we're also seeing in our, and the, um, that the, um, was mentioned earlier as well. We want to engage community stakeholders and to better understand their concerns, needs, and also to respond to those concerns. We wanna improve as well as a county we want to communicate effectively in culturally sensitive ways through trusted partners. You're gonna hear a lot more about that down the line from um, uh, other of my colleagues. We also wanna overcome as many barriers as possible to accessing the vaccine. And we know it's been frustrating for many of you and we're really working to improve geographic access, linguistic, cultural, technological, um, and documentations and more. And the whole time we acknowledge, we're just, we're all learning here. We have never stood up a ma major operation like this before in such a short period of time under so many constraints. And we look to you as experts to tell us what does it feel like on the ground? Next slide. So with transparency, we have been sharing the science. We've been, um, participating in three to four community forums each week to share our progress, to share our challenges, to hear from our partners about their experiences, their expertise, and identifying ways that we can improve. We've created four COVID-19 um, vaccine dashboards that I'll share with you more about later, but we wanted to be very upfront and transparent about what the vaccine process was looking like in our county and how well we were doing against equity in particular. We have been doing community engagement through um, many pathways, our community forums that we're, hold, that we're holding or we're invited to, um, as well as the Vaccine Communication Equity Working Group that is meeting weekly that we'll talk more about. We're also communicating in culturally effective sensitive ways by really looking to community leaders to lead the path, to help identify those messages, to identify the messengers, to identify the pathways and outreach. And that really helps us make sure that the, the specific cultures are, um, are being addressed. And acknowledging the painful history, we are just continually bringing that to the forefront. We've developed a document that shares some of the historic um, references to some of the atrocities that have happened previously because we know there's been talk about this and people acknowledge but some people don't quite know the challenges and the extent to which uh, this could be painful for people's lives immediately around them that this wasn't something that happened centuries ago that this was people's lives this were people's aunties that still live here in California today and we need to be aware of that so that we're approaching all of these conversations, particularly around hesitancy, with a, a sense of informed understanding about the depth of the, the issue that we're facing here. Next slide. I'm not gonna go through all of these pieces I'm gonna that I'm putting on the slide, but what I wanted to share with you around access to challenges is just how much we're learning and improving. 
So on the left, I have challenges in the middle is what we're implementing now to address those challenges. And then on the right is, is strategies that we're working on or exploring right now to address the challenge. And when we first started, there was a lot over here on the right and very little on the, in the middle. And now it's vice versa, really. And we know registration challenges have been difficult for people. So we are working on, um, for example, reaching out through this equity working group that we, are, we put together. And one of the things that is really critical for a group like you would be to help people get registered, get registered uh, because it's not a, as easy as um, it is for other people. For some of us, it's easy to be online. We have access to the internet. We know easily how to look things up. Um, for other people, it's very difficult. And the more that we can help support people to actually get registered into clinics and opportunities, the more we can share opportunities um, out, the, the, the more we can get our communities vaccinated. Um, we've also been working on our eligibility so that we're not asking too much information. We're trying to find alternatives to government IDs, for example, accepting IDs from any country that you might have for verification. and just for um, this group sharing that kind of information because it may feel like a barrier to people not to, they don't wanna come because they don't have a license or an ID, just making sure to share that that was not, that would not be a barrier. Next slide. Geographic access has been a major challenge and we're trying multiple different ways, including experimenting with community-based sites. And we've done that with, um, at churches, at schools, on farm, um, vaccinations. And we have transportation options to some of our mass vaccination sites, as well as to our, um, our local clinics like Fair Oaks, Daly City Clinic, Ravenswood, and NEMS. And Samtrans recently made all their bus routes free for anyone that's actually getting vaccinated. And if people are Health Plan of San Mateo members, they can have their transportation covered. Also, Ready Wheels and Ready Coast Paratransit services are free and to eligible participants. So please continue to share those as well so that we can overcome that barrier for people who may not be aware. Next slide. Um, we're focusing on our most impacted community um, members, as I mentioned. And one thing we're still working on is a clear pathway to our homebound residents. We, are having, we have a small experiment underway this week, which we hope to build on. We're also providing in-language materials. Our, we have a notification tool so people can sign up for when we have clinics available that they may be eligible to for. And we're, we've had that translated based on the feedback that we've gotten from the community. Um, and we have a ways to go and we'll continue to work on it. And we're really excited about the materials that the Office of Community Affairs has developed in response to the feedback from our Community Vaccine Equity Working Group with that you'll see later. Next slide. We have great um, uh, vaccination dashboards that I'll share a little bit with you about later. Um, that you know, we started with uh, just sharing data during these forums that we would have, and we realized very quickly that we needed to have something that people could go to whenever they needed that would be updated at a regular basis. Um, that's a tool that I think any of you could be uh, going on to make sure that things, just to be aware of where we are with vaccinations, answer any questions that people may have. We have the SMC notification tool and it would be really wonderful to have more people signed on to that as well as the state my turn tool because that is how people will get connected to vaccination opportunities. And the more people you could help connect to that notification tool in my turn and get them signed up, the more um, the better. Next slide. So while I share you know, a good number of things that we have underway, we have just a lot of work still to do. We need multiple pathways to reach residents, high touch support through trusted partners. Um, we still have challenges with people reaching vaccination sites. What can we do to overcome that? We need more alternatives to online registration and clearer messaging through trusted partners like yourselves. There is a challenge with the fact that with our weekly allocations not being known, our vaccine clinics are coming up week, one week in advance. 
and people need consistency so they can plan ahead. And then the challenge that we are facing now is that we know that the vaccine supply for San Mateo County will be more limited in the future because of the state's focus on equity. The, the San Mateo County has limited, has very, has zero um, low healthy places index or healthy health equity communities within the county and 40% of vaccine allocations across the straight state will go to that low healthy places locations. Next slide. This is the tool, the data dashboard I wanted to share with you. On the top right you see is a map of our, the local county um, health equity communities. That means that they, this health equity index is that was mentioned actually by the state earlier, so I won't go too far into it, but it really looks at where are our most vulnerable populations. And we have a specific map that now shows how um, we're doing with vaccine penetration in the lowest um, HPI communities. We also have a, a dashboard that looks at um, race ethnicity. Um, we have one that looks at location of vaccines. Um, not just in the healthy places index categories and uh, lots of other great data that I, I hope you can go check out. Um, we have almost 180,000 of our San Mateo County residents vaccinated. That's getting close to 30% of the population that's eligible today, which is 16 plus. And 43% of those have received both vaccinations. And while we have about 180,000 re um, residents vaccinated, we have been vaccinated about 250,000 people. Um, they may work in San Mateo County, for example, or come from other parts of the region. Um, we have 69% of our 65 plus vaccinated and 75% of our 75 plus vaccinated. And that's particularly important because that is a population that is dying um, at, at multiple folds from the COVID virus. And so just having this level of um, penetration into that um, older adult population ensures that we're gonna see a lot less deaths going forward. Next slide. Oh, and from that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Danielle. Thanks, Shireen. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes talking with all of you about um, vac the vaccine communications and equity working group that we established um, with really the goal of um, working with our community partners through the pandemic to, to put together and to disseminate targeted communication so that we can share information about the vaccine, that we can address community concerns, and make sure that our hardest to reach are most impacted by COVID communities uh, get access to the vaccine. We've, we've worked with, um, there are more than 200 community leaders from both community-based organizations, nonprofits and government um, agencies who have been participating. Um, and we've been having weekly working group meetings for the last two months or so. We can go to the next slide. Some of the input that we heard from our working group um, about the community concerns are, are very much aligned with the community concerns that were shared by the state. You know, concerns about safety and side effects, lack of easily understood information, whether it's in terms of literacy level or whether it's in provided in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner, disinformation and misinformation, and you know, digital access and literacy. And then we've also had some um, wait and see, you know, I don't want to be the first <clears throat> um, to get the vaccine, I'll wait and see. Uh, and then, of course, frustration about shortages and availability of appointments. So we're very much at the local level hearing the same thing as the state. Um, we've broken our work group up into different focus areas um, across our different meetings. And at several of our meetings, we broke up to have really detailed focus on different communities within San Mateo County. Here are some examples of the community specific concerns that were raised you know, from the African American community, um, distrust in the medical community and government institutions, um, from the Chinese community, uh, an eagerness to get vaccinated, but a preference to get that vaccine 
um, from their in-language doctor or their own medical provider. Um, from the Filipino community, we heard concerns about misinformation and disinformation, and um, especially that is being spread through social media. From our Latinx community, uh, we heard um, concerns over immigration status and privacy, um, what information would be shared or what risks um, people would be undertaking just by providing their information. And then finally, from the Pacific Islander community, um, a readiness and eagerness to get vaccinated, but concerns that their elders weren't getting at, uh, sufficient access to the vaccine. If we can go to the next slide. Um, our, we, we work to prepare um, sort of top line messages to address concerns um, across the county. And then we've also tailored these messages um, by sub community. So um, at the top line, you know, around safety, the vaccine is safe and effective. After you get vaccinated, you still need to continue to wear a mask and social distance to keep everyone safe. In terms of availability, there will be enough vaccine for everyone. Um, although the current supply is limited, more vaccine is being produced every day. And the vaccine is free and available to everyone, regardless of immigration status. In terms of access, if you don't have health insurance or a doctor, you can still get vaccinated for free. And then finally, around hesitancy, that the, the vaccine is our best opportunity to be back with our loved ones again. We really wanted to hone in this message and make it motivating to individuals. Um, and so we, we had that focus on being able to be back with the people we love in our lives. Next slide. Um, we've also worked, because, because we are not the ones that are going to be um, talking with all our neighbors and friends and family, um, that we're really partnering with community leaders, we've worked to develop talking points. So a much more in-depth um, response to some of the community concerns that were identified um, to, to be able to equip our leaders with information um, and framing of issues so that as they speak with the community, they have at their ready um, much more information so that they can address those community concerns. Um, we had information, um, we had COVID, COVID vaccine facts. And then most recently, um, last week, we focused on the, the new Janssen vaccine and put together talking points specific to that. Um, we've worked with our county health colleagues um, and um, clinicians to both participate in the meetings and then to also review all of this information to make sure it's accurate. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Anna Gonzalez, who can tell us more about how we've taken all of this feedback and this kind of larger context and information, and then we're really deploying um, information and resources out into the community. Hi, thank you, Danielle, and, um, and thank you, everybody. You know, today's presentation, I will review and share tailored examples specific to San Mateo County and our outreach material that's currently in market. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about and describe the process to engage members to be part of that change and to help their community stay safe and encourage the vaccination. Share the partnership that was developed with our local ethnic media, radio, PSAs that are also currently in market. And finally, we're going to share some, a few success stories from our own community provider, um, Miriam from Nuestra Casa. And at the end of the presentation, we'll allow you an opportunity to ask any questions of the, from us as well. Next slide, please. As a counter response to COVID-19 pandemic, it is essential that we continue our work with trusted messengers um, to ensure that the community receives information in a culturally competent and timely manner and how to remain safe, healthy, and informed. We educate and motivate community members about the vaccine, how to access the vaccine, what to do to prepare oneself while waiting their turn and instill confidence in the vaccine. Meeting these objectives will help us keep residents healthy, ensure all residents have access to the vaccine regardless of citizenship status, and provide all residents with information and dispelling myths about COVID-19 and the, the, what, how it protects us from the infection. As we know, research has shown that people more, are more likely to become vaccinated if they are knowledgeable about both the disease and the vaccine that protects them from the infection. Next slide, please. 
Um, you know, we attempt, there is a multi-prong approach. As we know, we have to use many different things. You've heard through the Mentimeter, it's not one way. There's not a one entry way. This is a complex issue and a complex system. And so we use targeted media um, to really target down to by zip code, by ethnicity, by race, by culture. We use social media, flyers, fact sheets, whether they're in leaflet, hang, door hangers, um, and whether they're virtual events such as today, um, our town hall, our Facebook events that are targeting in our evening or during the day, but it really requires um, working with community partners yourself, our community residents, because everyone is a leader and this is a trusted messenger, whether it's the I say the paletero that's down the street that's giving out the candy or, or selling our palet, you know, our ice cream. It's the grocery store clerk. Each person is an influencer. And so we rely on our all community members to be part of that change and help us get that information through. Next slide, please. You will see in the upcoming slides, all outreach and collateral materials or PSAs or videos and other materials developed aligned to the top, um, top line messages reviewed and approved by our vaccine equity work group that Danielle mentioned earlier. Again, the vaccine equity work group represents over 200 community partners and all their feedback. All of our top line messages have been translated in Spanish, Chinese, Tagalog, Tongan, Samoan, and they're all available for usage. Next slide, please. Equity is key component in our vaccine effort, advancing healthy equity in San Mateo County by reducing the positivity rate in the bottom quartile is critical on how San Mateo County will define success around communication and vaccination overall. To inform and encourage community members to get vaccinated, our office has developed flyers and posters regarding the COVID vaccine. These, these are some examples of the uh, flyers and posters that have been distributed to community partners, circulated on social media, given to apartment owners, and are posted on the County Outreach Toolkit website and, and available in all six languages that I spoke about. And they're available at any time for print and for downloading, so please visit our, our uh, County um, Outreach Toolkit. Next slide, please. Over the past few weeks, we have discussed the importance of signing up for to be notified when someone will be eligible for the vaccine. We heard from, the, uh, from our own equity work group uh, breakout sessions, the importance and challenges of getting residents to register for both sites. For example, East Palo Alto with a population of nearly 30,000 residents, um, only about an estimated 2,000 residents had registered for the county notification tool. This was concerning. A postcard was developed and we will and will be mailed to, to send to the lowest healthy places index with high positivity rates to promote the vaccine notification sites. I'm happy to say next week every East Palo Alto and Bell Haven resident will receive a direct mail and we hope to have this same flyer distributed or postcard distributed to all vulnerable communities which is an approximately 65,000 households in San Mateo County. Next slide, please. As you can see, these postcards are now available in multiple languages, Chinese, Samoan, Spanish, Tagalog, and Tongan. This is one of the many things located on the Outreach Toolkit. Please visit the online toolkit and download any one of these flyers, postcards, social media graphics, and they're available, as I said, in multiple languages. Next slide, please. As we talked about, there is no wrong approach. There, there is many approaches that we use. And evidence-based research shares the importance of repeating messages multiple times before individuals take action. Another approach used to communicate with community members through door-to-door -door canvassing, using door hangers. As we know, this is proven to be the most effective. In the process, we complete message testing obtain feedback from our funded partners and finally assess and um, finally get an assessment of our funded partners asking um, who would be able to use these door hangers and an in-person outreach. After receiving our feedback from our partners, we're able to order and distribute the door hangers to community-based organizations so they too can do this door hanging um, in-person canvassing. 
These door hangers, like I said, are also available in our toolkit and available and have already been in use and distributed within our many of our vulnerable communities. Next slide, please. Um, recently, we were able to conduct um, unhoused housing um, material and direct response. And so this unhoused community graphics in partnership with the health department, we were able to create some uh, graphics that are now available in market as well. Next slide, please. And again, and this shows the importance of um, wearing a mask, washing your hands, um, should you have any symptoms, where, who to contact and where to go for those services. Next slide, please. Here's a few examples of the billboards and market encouraging community members to get vaccinated and continue to wear a mask to help stop the spread. The ability to switch out billboard ads and messaging every four weeks helps keep messages relevant. This is also shared and available um, and being used through our city digital billboards as well. But this is just an example of something that's up in North Fair Oaks in Redwood City. Next slide, please. And as we've seen on the Mentimeter, social media and other streaming services are strategies we deploy as well. Utilizing WeChat, Instagram, Spotify, Telemundo, Univision, La Opinion, AccuWeather, just to name a few. Here's an example of a couple of the digital ads using a very micro-targeted approach by zip code and by language. We developed digital banner ads, how to access neighborhood testing sites, and the importance of why I want to receive the vaccine. And we have it, as you can see, in different languages. When San Mateo County residents are online and they see these banner ads, they're able to click on them and get routed to San, the San Mateo County website directly. For example, if your browser is set for English or Spanish, you will see the corresponding banners in language. We are currently working on developing more vaccine banner ads in various languages. We have the ability to boost ads and conduct them at a very micro-targeted level. Which, is a, which we will be able to be based on data trends we receive from public health and feedback. For example, if there's a high positivity rate in a particular zip code in an area, we can specifically say, let's target this age group, this zip code, and write down to the language and to that area. That's an example of what we're able to do now. Next slide, please. We are happy to be collaborating with Univision, who is playing the Spanish PSAs made by the Office of Community Affairs. The PSAs were developed in English and in Spanish, the audio of which are being played in online now on radio, as well as on our local radio stations, such as KPDO, Pescadero, and uh, KHMP, MB, Half Moon Bay. The Spanish PSAs can be found also on Univision's website. After meeting with organizations and farm workers along the coast, we heard feedback that many of the residents received their news from popular Spanish radio stations. The Spanish radio ads that Office of Community Affairs developed will also are also playing on local Univision Spanish owned stations. For example, 105.7 FM or 98.9 or 98.9 as well, um, FM radio, and Amor 100.3, just to name a few. We are currently developing a Spanish uh, PSA that we'll ho we hope that will be played on TV as well. Next slide, please. Among some of the local videos um, that we've created that are in market are from our own local leaders and trusted messengers that we have developed. Um, here's one for an example from our Tonga Consulate General and our agriculture workers from Half Moon Bay. We remember, we talk about they have to look like me um, and how important it is that somebody is recognized and in language and ethnicity and culturally competent and responsive. These are examples of that. As a result, we collaborated with the Tonga Radio to play this as a radio and video on PSA at, as earned media. Radio Tonga has also given us an hour of their radio station, and we're currently developing a radio forum series with them. And I'd like to take a minute to play each of these videos as a glimpse of the approach that, that we use videos. We use this in a more organic, natural setting approach 
to conduct it and we use it to then uh, really do a micro targeted approach. If we don't take a few seconds or minutes to do that, that'd be great. Yo por protección y porque amo a mi familia y quiero a mi gente. Pues la vacuna es, puede ser una solución para que ya se acabe con esta pandemia. Es un bien para todos, para protección de, de todas las personas. Yo me voy a poner la vacuna por protección personal y de mi familia y de mis compañeros de trabajo. Que todos nos pongamos la vacuna para bien de toda la, la gente. Next slide, please. Thank you. As the counter response to the COVID-19 pandemic, it is essential that we continue our work with trusted uh, community members to ensure that the community receives culturally competent, timely information about how to remain safe, healthy, and informed. Educate and motivate our community members about the vaccine and how to access the vaccine what to do to prepare oneself while waiting their turn and to instill confidence in the vaccine are some of those examples. As part of our community campaign, uh, the Office of Community Affairs is collecting self-recorded videos from community members. These videos, such as the one you've just seen, um, these videos can be recorded by staff or by community members speaking from their voice, their experience about the importance of social distancing, wearing a mask, testing and their experience of getting the vaccine or why they're waiting to get the vaccine. All languages are encouraged. The unique approach was meant to be in a natural setting that would resonate most with community residents. It's as easy as a one, two, three step process. This, this is an example of the video guidelines, talking points and submission process that's available on the County Outreach Toolkit website. And this is also available in multiple languages. You can submit the videos and we'll highlight that through our own social media channels and we can do any of the editing. We encourage you today to consider providing us your own very own organic natural setting video, please. Next slide, please. We've talked a lot about where you can find this information in the San Mateo County. We invite you to access any of our collateral materials and share it to distribute it in different languages as we talked about. All print material and social media graphics can be found on the San Mateo County COVID Outreach Toolkit and free to use at any time. If you go to the smcgov.org um, and you can find that on the Outreach Toolkit. Next slide, please. You know, Emma, Emma yes. hi, it's Pamela. I just want to, um, I think we're running short of time. Okay. I want to um, just be able to allow sufficient time for our speakers. Uh, and I think we have another another uh, speaker, uh, Miriam, after this. Right, I was introducing her. Yeah, so okay. I've already cut you short. I'm just, we're, we, we really are running out of time. Um, but okay. really great information. And now we people know where to find the toolkit. And then uh, um, there's been several questions asked that Shireen, thank you, has been uh, helpful in answering uh, along the way. Um, so without further ado, we'll bring in uh, Miriam. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Yupanqui and I'm the executive director at Nuestra Casa. I would like to thank the County of San Mateo and Thrive Alliance for organizing this event and for inviting me. Nuestra Casa is a community-based organization and we have been serving the most vulnerable community members in the Mid-Peninsula over the past 19 years. 
Our offices are based in East Palo Alto, but we also do work in the Bellhaven and North Fair, Oak, North Fair Oaks and Road City communities. I will talk a little bit about some of the effective messages that resonate more with our community members, as well as talk about some of the strategies that Nuestra Casa has utilized in order to continue to do effective vaccine communications. When it comes to effective messages and collateral, it's very important, like Emma mentioned, to take cultural competency in consideration. Community members want to hear from individuals who look like them. They want scientific data to be simplified. And most importantly, they want to hear these messages in their native language, whether it's Spanish, Tongan, or Samoan. And I can give a personal example. My parents are both longtime East Palo Alto residents, and they are essential workers who work in the county. And when, they first, when the vaccine first came out, like many of us, they had many questions. They were hesitant about getting the vaccine, but fortunately I was able to provide them with some of the videos that Nuestra Casa has created and I was also able to share some of the county graphics with them. And that enabled them to feel a little bit more comfortable about getting the vaccine. So now I'm happy to report that both of my parents have received their first vaccine. However, I do have to say that the process was not necessarily easy for them. Both of my parents have a sixth grade education in their native country and have limited technology skills. So I had to help my mom with the registration process. And having said that, many of our community members really do need that one-on-one -on -one support. They need individuals to walk them through the process, translate materials if necessary. So this is something that Nuestra Casa hopes to engage just over the weeks to come. When it comes to strategies, uh, like many organizations, Nuestra Casa has pivoted our traditional one-on-one -on -one engagement to more virtual platforms. And one of our strategies has been in creating short 30 to 45 second videos that talk about um, vaccine information, the county's 211 resource, and more, more recently, we did a video on the MyTurn website. We feel that these videos are very effective because they're short, they're simple, and then they're in, also in Spanish. So when it comes to another effective strategy, Nuestra Casa at the moment is also active on four social media platforms. But I do have to say that two of the platforms that work best in terms of engaging with our community members are Facebook and Instagram. So through those platforms, we're able to disseminate our videos and also any county resources. Another strategy that Nuestra Casa has implemented is through our food distribution program. We currently run a food distribution program in Redwood City and in East Palo Alto twice a week. And we're able to connect with community members through that way. We're able to print graphics, print flyers in English, Spanish, Spanish, and other languages. And through the food distribution program, we also have the capability of texting our, our program participants. And on a monthly basis, we're able to reach around 6,000 individuals through our food distribution program. So our food distribution program has really also enabled us to create a community over the past year. We've been able to um, previously um, communicate information around census and voter engagement and now vaccine information. So it has been very uh, successful. And I do have to say that when it comes to engaging community members at the end of the day, it's really important to come in with a with a mentality of collaboration and enabling them that they are in a position of power. Many community members might not have the option to work from home, but they do have the option to take the vaccine when their turn is available. So thank you so much for enabling me to be here and share a little bit more about Nuestra Casa strategies. Thank you, Miriam. 
Um, so there's, I, we kind of went over time and there's been a, a lot of questions that were asked in the chat. And uh, again, thank you, Shireen, for answering some of those. If you have additional questions for any of our panelists um, listed here, you can write those in the chat. We have a way to save those and then uh, disperse them to the, um, to the presenters and get answers for you. Uh, and so uh, without uh, further ado, because we are running short on time, I want to um, hand it back over to Georgia, who will introduce our next presenter. Okay, uh, our next presenter will get the balance of the time. Uh, no need for extensive closing remarks. I wanted to welcome Brandon Bowser Carr, who is a quantitative research associate at the John W. Gardner Center for Youth and their communities at Stanford University. Um, we sent out his bio ahead of time. He'll, he'll be giving us a update on the ongoing study and also on next steps on the study um, on the local community. Thank you so much for, uh, to Brandon for being here. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, uh, Georgia and Pamela, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, obviously, what I'm going to talk about today are going to be some pretty challenging um, findings to hear about that we've all been um, surrounded by for a while. And so just want to kind of acknowledge that. Um, and before I get into the talk itself, I do want to thank our generous funders, Redwood City Education Foundation, the City of Redwood City, Sequoia Healthcare District, and the Stanford Office of Community Engagement. Um, so a little bit about the, the study. Um, basically what we did was we sent out a five to 10 minute English and Spanish survey um, to uh, members of Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. Um, we eventually did some statistics to be able to extrapolate to a larger population to um, all of San Mateo County and our findings are robust to that. Um, but we did find we, we did conduct the sample within Redwood City and North Fair Oaks. Um, the, the study topics included food, childcare, housing, education, employment, technology, medical care, demographics, um, and we also asked people about uh, resources in the, in the local area. Um, and it was a household survey, which just means that uh, one participant answered for their entire household. Um, so how did we get the survey into people's hands? Um, we worked closely with a number of community stakeholders. They're listed all right here. Um, and they distributed the survey through their various um, constituencies through uh, recruitment channels that they use. So through text messages, newsletters, email blasts, periodicals, social media, word of mouth. Um, and these data were collected in September and October. So this is a snapshot of unmet need um, in that uh, particular time frame. Um, and I can't go through the full list of all of our community partners, but you can see them right here. Um, they were um, obviously um, instrumental in getting the study uh, done. So a little bit about the sample itself. Um, we got 1,400 responses in total, um, but um, after data cleaning, we narrowed that down to um, 1,150. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about data from the basic needs data, um, which uh, was a subsample of 890 responses. Um, so the statistics you're going to see today are based off of those 890 people. And if you remember, uh, this is a household survey. So again, people answered for everyone in their household. When you account for the number of people in the household, there's about 3,500 people represented in the survey. And that's about 4% of the Redwood City population is represented in the survey today. So a little bit about the demographics. Um, our, uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, we were actually pretty representative and we were really encouraged by this. Um, we had a slight overcount of Latinx people and a slight undercount of Asian people, but otherwise um, the survey was, was very representative of the um, demographics of the area. Um, in terms of education level, um, we, we had a higher proportion of people with advanced degrees, graduate or professional degrees. Um, but in general, we actually had a pretty um, diverse sample for education levels. You'll see right here, 14% had less than a high school education, 11% a high school graduate or GED. And you can kind of see going down the list here. So we had a good diversity of education levels. Um, I'm going to talk about key takeaways at the top, and then I'm going to unpack some of these findings for you as I kind of um, uh, go through the actual data. Um, so in terms of healthcare, food, and housing, um, healthcare insecurity, we, 
we have seen has always been high um, and it appears to be staying constant from before COVID. So 20 to 25% of households um, have foregone health care because of the cost or had trouble paying for health care. Um, in terms of food insecurity, we've seen a dramatic increase in rates of food insecurity in the community. So going from 6% of the community was food insecure before COVID, um, now 15% um, have, have been food insecure. And again, I'll show you the actual um, questions and response rates um, in a moment. Housing insecurity has also increased. Um, about a third of renters have missed at least one rental payment and 7% um, have been threatened with eviction since the start of COVID. And this has also doubled um, since, since before COVID. Um, and one of the findings that we think is really, um, really jumped out at us um, was that Spanish language respondents were six times as likely to be food insecure. So whereas 5% of English speakers were food insecure, 30% of Spanish speakers were food insecure. So much higher rates of food insecurity among Spanish speakers specifically. And we didn't see um, effects that dramatic for other demographic groups that are correlated with speaking Spanish, like Latinx individuals or residents of North Fair Oaks. Um, looking at the digital divide and distance learning, um, we found that whereas um, there was broad access to some kind of internet and some kind of um, connected device, access to high quality internet, like installed broadband internet was far lower and access to a physical desktop or laptop computer was also far lower as compared to some kind of connected device. Um, and the two challenges that uh, respondents indicated having with distance learning was lack of a private workspace. This was the most frequent one. And we found even higher rates among uh, families with more children. Um, so as you might imagine, if you have two or three or four kids having to use one bedroom, um, it can be hard for all of them to simultaneously do distance learning. Um, and we also sat, found that uh, people had a lot of challenges with um, getting enough support from schools um, on their work. Um, looking at a uh, child care burden, um, we found that over half of full-time workers are caring for children eight or more hours a day, which is also a dramatic increase from what it was um, before the pandemic. Um, and then unemployment and furlough rates have doubled since COVID, which is uh, probably not a huge surprise. We've seen a lot of statistics on that one in the, in the news. All right, well, now I'm gonna uh, drill down a little bit deeper into each of these and give you um, some of that data. Um, so first we're gonna talk about food insecurity. Um, so this is just um, looking at in the sample, in that 4% uh, of Redwood City sample, we found 255 youth are living in a food insecure household um, and 761 youth are living in a household where adults worry that food will run out. And remember, this is just in the sample. This is just that 3,500 people. Um, this is about uh, one, you know, one out of 20 Red, Redwood City residents are represented here. Um, so extrapolating from that, you know, you can multiply that figure by 20 to get our estimate of what it would be in the whole uh, population. Um, so here's one of those questions. This is how we're coming at, this is what, this is what we're looking at when we're saying rates of food insecurity um, have increased. Um, so the, the two options that we count as being food insecure are often not having enough to eat and sometimes not having enough to eat. And as you can see here, 15% during COVID and a smaller share from before COVID. Um, if we also included um, those who have enough to eat, but not the kinds of food, maybe the nutritious food that they want, um, then our rates of food insecurity would be even higher, of course, 25% of people um, indicating that they don't have the kinds of food that they want. Um, and here we're looking at food, um, uh, fear that their food will run out. Um, this is 40% after COVID um, as compared to 25% before COVID. So 40% of households um, worry that their food could run out. Um, Here's the, um, some demographic subgroups. Um, we chose a few that might be of interest for folks. Um, we see that parents have about equivalent rates of food insecurity, but again, we see much higher rates amongst Spanish language speakers um, in terms of food insecurity, um, up to 35% uh, facing 
uh, food insecurity. Now, now I'm going to look at housing. Um, again, just within that sample, just that 3,500 people, we found that 314 youth live in a household that is missed rent and 176 youth live in a household that has received a utility shutoff notice, um, informed that their utilities could be shut off because of lack of payment. Again, this is 5% of the population. You can multiply these numbers by 20 to get our projections of what the full extent of unmet need in the area is. Um, so this is one of those questions. Um, over a third of households did not pay all of their rent. Um, so that's um, both the light and dark orange bar there. Um, the dark orange bar means they didn't pay any of their rent. And then the light orange means that they were able to pay some of their rent in the prior three months, but not all. And again, this is much higher from before COVID. Um, Eviction threats have also gone up, and we know there's a complicated set of paperwork that folks have to um, uh, complete. And there's a, you know, even though there is a moratorium on evictions, there's um, these are not necessarily um, illegal evictions. There's a lot of legal work that needs to be done to be um, um, eligible for that moratorium. Um, but we do see that um, eviction rates have doubled since COVID, which is in the context of a moratorium. Um, here's that figure for utility shutoff. Again, 14% of households, of renter households, excuse me, have been informed that their utilities could be shut off. Um, and we see higher rates of um, uh, unmet or uh, 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 non-rental payment um, among a, a variety of demographic groups, including Spanish language speakers, Latinx folks, uh, North Fair Oaks residents, that's what NFO stands for. So now I'm going to talk about healthcare insecurity. Um, just in our sample, 620 youth relied on public health care. Um, and also in our sample, 355 youth live in a household that forewent care, meaning they did not get care because of the cost. Um, and I'm going to show you some of those actual statistics. Um, so this is uh, reported rates of having trouble paying uh, medical bills. Um, these have increased modestly. Um, so there is some increased need in, in healthcare. Um, it's not as dramatic as what we've seen for food and housing, um, but we do see some increased need, um, uh, particularly with having trouble paying for bills. But when we ask people about, did you uh, forego care? Did you choose to not get healthcare because of the cost? Um, Respondents told us this has not increased. So unlike basically every other need, um, respondents did not tell us that their rates of uh, foregoing care have increased. And this is for physical care. And then, oh, I dropped a slide. I have uh, mental care as well. We asked about mental care in addition to physical care, and we saw the same trend as, as with physical care. The statistics were basically the same. Um, so this is the digital divide. Um, we found that 99% of households with school-aged children have some form of connected device, some way of accessing the internet, um, but only 82% of households have a literal desktop or laptop computer. So rates of high quality um, uh, technology are much lower than any technology. And here are some of these um, some subgroups. So you have parents, parents of school-aged children specifically, um, North Fair Oaks residents and Latinx residents, and you can see slightly higher um, for Latinx residents, but generally everyone has some connected device. But here's with computer, you can see that people who have a computer is um, a much smaller share that have a computer. And we also see larger gaps between demographic groups when it comes to computer as opposed to any internet. Um, so North Fair Oaks residents, Latinx folks all have much higher, or excuse me, much lower um, access to a computer. And again, this is looking at access to any internet. We see that broadly everyone has in general access to internet. But when we ask about installed internet, do you have access to um, uh, like an installed internet in your home? We see um, not only much lower rates, but also larger gaps between demographic groups. Um, I'm going to talk about distance learning. I know this is a bit of a blitz. I'm happy to uh, unpack some of these if folks um, have questions. 
Um, so nearly a third of, of families in the sample lacked access to a private place to work last spring. That was the most common challenge that was endorsed. Um, and a fifth of families had insufficient support with teachers or school staff. That was um, the second most common challenge. And here I'm showing you um, those statistics kind of broken out. You can see that access to privacy was higher among families with English learners and with children in special education. Um, this is one of the other questions. This was about having enough time to complete work. And we see this was not really as nearly as much of a challenge as um, having a private space to work and study. Um, people did not indicate having a lot of trouble with having enough time to complete the work. Similarly, access to online materials was not a common challenge, and it was pretty uh, uh, universal across demographic groups, um, around 10% or less had that challenge. And then here for teacher support, we saw um, actually an uptick for families with special education students had um, somewhat higher uh, rates of this particular challenge, which maybe isn't a surprise given the additional needs that a special education student would require. All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, child care burden, um, the second shift. Um, and we found that households are spending a lot more time on child care, but um, one silver lining is that they're spending less money on child care. Um, and I'm going to go through these next few ones pretty quickly because I want to give uh, time for Pamela and Georgia to close. But um, one thing that we do see is that um, a large share of families are providing 12 or more hours of childcare on a work day. And this has increased dramatically since before COVID. And that's probably not a big surprise to the people in this audience. Um, as you know, um, a lot of people are, are providing childcare while they're, while they're working their, um, their work shift. Um, but money, uh, the amount that people are spending on money has gone down. Looking at job insecurity, um, before and after COVID, um, total hours worked have decreased since COVID um, and wages have decreased um, as well. And we see that wage decrease is primarily among people who are making less than $50,000 before the pandemic. So if you were making more than 50, your wage probably didn't go down. But if you were making 50 or less, your wage probably did go down after the pandemic. And here are unemployment and furlough rates um, before and after the pandemic. Again, you can see that these have about doubled, actually a little bit more than doubled uh, since the pandemic. Last thing I'm going to talk about are some community resources. Um, we found that 86% of parents are aware of Redwood City school lunches, which was exciting. Um, we did also find that 27% of renters are not are, are aware of Redwood City uh, rental assistance. So we saw lower awareness of the rental assistance uh, in the community. Um, and this was including among those who were who had missed the rental payment. Still, we saw about 25% of people who were housing insecure were aware of uh, rental assistance, meaning 75% of housing insecure renters didn't know about rental assistance. And here's a breakdown of several resources that we asked about in the community. You can see that Redwood City Lunches, Second Harvest have really high um, knowledge. That's the light orange bar and uptake. That's the green bar. Um, whereas rental assistance and some of the other resources um, had lower knowledge and awareness. And then the last statistic I'm going to show you is for community resource preferences. Um, even though the food resources in the community had the highest awareness and uptake, um, free meals and pantry bags were still the most popular um, service, that uh, potential service um, that, that the community could provide. And then you can see it kind of flattens out from there with uh, free Wi-Fi, rental assistance, and hotspots all kind of being around you know, 50, 45 and then free public transit and tech support hubs being um, somewhat lower in terms of preference. Um, so food um, and then also technology and rent were the top ones that people really wanted um, for, for the community. We have a bunch of next steps. Um, we want to, uh, I, we have a lot of things we want to do, but I want to save time. So I'll just quickly say we want to survey again um, in the next month or two. Um, we want to ask about the vaccine. We want to ask about reopening. We know there's a lot of uh, 
uh, interests, a lot of concern around mental health. Um, we want to ask about those things. And then we just want to track um, some of the same statistics you saw today to see how things are going in spring and be able to look at change over time. Um, so that's our next steps and I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Georgia and Pamela. Thanks, Brandon. I recognize that we had a few questions from the audience uh, uh, specific to yours. And I think one in particular, somebody wants to know if you will be sending out the slides and information. And I also let them know that you're not only sending that out, but that you're going to be uh, soliciting feedback and, uh, and, and potential collaboration with additional uh, CBOs and leaders in the community. Am I right about that? Yes, yes, that's okay. absolutely true. Um, if if you have a, a group that you think um, would value a conversation uh, about these data, um, you know, especially if you have interest in particular subgroups, what rates of unmet need exist among, you know, young children, among immigrants, among different groups, um, I, I have those data, you know, there's a million ways we could slice and dice the data. Um, if you have some targeted questions, please reach out to us. We would love to have these data be used um, for service. That's, that's the goal of this work. Um, and, and if you have qu uh, additional questions you'd like in our next survey that you think would be really valuable for you and uh, your, your team, please let us know. Um, again, the main ones we've heard are questions about the vaccine, mental health, and reopening, like, you know, schools reopening, um, concerns about that, um, barriers or whatnot. Um, but if you have other ones, we'd love to hear that too. Yeah. And we'll, we will send out the slides. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. I, we just have, what, two, maybe one minute left. I'm going to hand it over to Georgia, but I just want to say thank you to everybody who participated on the uh, forum today and to our presenters. There was a lot of information and um, and it's, it's really heartening to see the way the state and the county and all of our partners are really approaching the vaccine distribution with, with compassion and equity, uh, really focused on that, making sure that everyone has access. And, um, and you can see the efforts that have gone into it. Incredible efforts. I think it's been a, an incredible job that everybody's been doing. And I just want to say thank you. Um, and uh, and the, the healthcare district is certainly here and ready to partner with people when uh, when that's a, makes sense and appropriate. Um, so we look forward to continue dialogue and uh, in the last minute, take it away, Georgia. Uh, yeah, thank you to our presenters again. And also thank you to the audience members. You have been wonderful. I just wanna let you know that Thrive is here for advocacy as well. So as you encounter things in the community around vaccine equity uh, that you want changed, we may not be able to solve everything, but we have already sent out letters, signed letters, and we are willing to continue to partner with the county, the state, uh, with the Sequoia Healthcare District to try to advocate because I think things will come up along the way. So I just wanted to leave you with that note. This has been incredible information today. We'll be sending out the recording. We wish we had had, had more time for all of you, but I, I think we'll be um, connecting again to continue the conversation. So have a great afternoon and thank you all.